Well, good morning. I think one of the best parts about getting to do two different services is to get to hear the music twice. It's absolutely beautiful. I am so happy to be with you this morning. Uh, This is always a wonderful, wonderful treat for me as the director of an interfaith organization in North Carolina. We often uh, joke that interfaith means uh, Methodists and Baptists talking to each other. (laughs) And to get to be in my um, home faith of Unitarian Universalism is a real treat. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, as, as Bill mentioned, I, I did attend Star King School for the ministry and happened to be classmates of two lovely, lovely people that have been directly connected with this congregation, Erica Hewitt and Mark Glovin, and they're dear friends, and I know they are here in spirit with us today as well. This sermon is a developing piece of work. Um, It was uh, started uh, while I was at Star King and continues to evolve um, as the first, some of the folks in the first um, service had some comments of some things that might be missing from it. And I always appreciate that from my UU family, (laughs) but I appreciate you uh, being here with me this morning as I share my story with you. This is titled, Creation Unfolding, Evolution Occurring, God Becoming. I am part of a generation called X. This refers to the group of people who were born during the Vietnam War. We grew and developed our basic selves through Nixon and Carter. We created our sense of the world in the era of Reagan and MTV. We became adults in the age of Clinton. Perhaps we have gotten our famous generation title from the notion that X marks the spot in time where the sacred is in impasse. Certainly it has seemed that way since I can remember. Through the efforts of activists in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, I grew up with the knowledge that I was partly responsible for much of the suffering and injustice that was taking place in the world. As a white person, I was experiencing white privilege. Coming from an upper middle class family, I was part of the elite in an economic caste system. As an American, I consumed more than any other country's citizen did. Unlike many of my generation X brothers and sisters who have become overwhelmed with this awareness, I was in search about what to do about it. What needed to change? How could I know all of this, be told of my heritage of oppression, and still have hope and motivation? My last semester of college, a faculty member named Michael McAvoy organized a group of students to focus on solutions. He realized that it was not enough to point out what is wrong with society, we must provide alternatives and a space for resolution. That was the beginning of a new curriculum titled Culture, Ecology, and Sustainable Community. We learned about watersheds and riparian corridors. We studied concepts of permaculture and community-supported agriculture. This kind of education created a complete shift in my cognizance. I realized that I did not know how to take care of myself or my community. It was the first time I thought about the most basic questions. Where does my water come from? Where does my food come from? Where do my clothes come from? I completed my undergraduate degree with the overwhelming sense that there was something very wrong about the way young people are educated in our culture, and that my years as an underachiever in school reflected most teachers' lack of opportunity to really teach the wisdom of basic life skills. The focus of work in education and child development is out of context with the state of our environment. As educators, we are skipping some vital basic information, focusing solely on human relationships and developed society. 
We are developing young people who have little connection to life's natural dependencies. I decided to focus in on this challenge and became a field teacher at an outdoor environmental science school. In the beginning, I followed the traditional science-oriented lesson plan, teaching the details of the forest ecosystem in riparian communities. However, every year, it did not fail that 90% of the kids who came out to camp could not focus on anything and, or any kind of lesson plan other than the simple discipline of can and cannots in the outdoors. I realized that there was a missing link in the work that we do as educators. I was asking the children to learn the importance of the interdependent web without sharing the whole story. There was more going on in that forest of life than scientific naming. I wanted them to know the mystery of the forest, the secret puzzle of life, but no one had ever taught me. I decided to take a different approach and changed my field teaching of science into field vision quests. I learned about Native American practices of the medicine wheel and used it to teach interdependence and nature theory. I spent much of my time on trails leading sessions of silence. I could see the increased awareness in the children. As the young people deepened their connection to the earth, I was developing my sense of the holy. Everything began to take on the spiritual. It was as though God was speaking through me as I told the children stories of the universe. I knew in reality that I had accessed the knowledge of the ancestors. It became time to take a journey on my own vision quest. I knew that I needed to make a change in my life to move away from teaching select groups of young people and begin taking direct action for the environment. I focused on broad questions of what is my purpose? How can I best be of service? One word kept coming into my consciousness, religion. Over and over again, religion, religion, religion. As a person of faith who was raised Unitarian, and as an adult who did not attend any kind of traditional church, this came as a bit of a shock. My question was, what's going on with religion? After much thought and struggle, I decided that I better find out what is going on with religion. The idea of studying theology began to make perfect sense. The missing link that I had spent years working on was somehow intricately wrapped up in the relationship of people to the earth, humans to that which is sacred. During my first year at Star King School of the Ministry was when I began to develop a concept of theology. Theology is a conviction that our point of existence in this world is to harmonize with nature. Theology, I believe, is the critical bridge to reinventing our culture. We each hold a story of our personal evolution in consciousness. This in itself is the work of creation. And it is this makeup of each individual's experience that creates the realities of community. My developing personal theology, or theology, stems from the belief that evolution and creation are of the same essence. In fact, they are the processes of each other. This theory holds center the notion of God becoming, that creation is constantly unfolding, and that evolution is the driving force. Or vice versa, that evolution is constantly occurring, and that creation is the driving force. It has been the stance of both fundamental religions and fundamental scientists that these are two separate concepts. This dualism has encouraged a secular organization of society, producing a secularized structure of public education and government. 
the role of the church has become one of strictly spiritual responsibilities, leaving world matters to the efforts of science. Although there are benefits to this organization of society, there are some critical problems, the greatest being our lack of connection to the interdependent web of life. By separating our thoughts concerning creation and evolution, we have removed our experience as spiritual beings from our experiences as human beings. And the results have become disastrous. As the universe has been unfolding, so too has creation. In the birth of humanity, consciousness, the meeting place of life force and its development, became conscious of itself. This too has shown to be an evolutionary process. However, as our consciousness has been evolving, creation has continued to unfold, and through the distinctions of science and religion, we have disconnected our evolving consciousness from the process of creation. Therefore, we are developing an intellect that is disconnected from its source. We have allowed the brain to supersede the adjoining organs that allow life to exist, just as we have believed humanity to overrule the adjoining life species that provide our existence. In order for the process of life to continue, consciousness must intercede and form community. This has been a recurring pattern in the evolution of creation. If we look back to the earliest forms of life, we find the single-celled prokaryote, which was first able to trap sunlight. In this process, they began to emit oxygen that acted as a poison to other bacteria. Survival demanded that communities form to use oxygen as a positive, and these prokaryotes evolved into eukaryotes. This is a very early example of crea creation and evolution as one. As sunlight was harnessed, the prokaryotes invented a new energy, and in the response to the creation, new life evolved. This is the foundation from which our consciousness has developed over millions and millions of years. And yet we find ourselves in a similar place as the first life forms. In representing scientific theory as evolution and religious belief as creation, I believe we can better understand the role that consciousness must play in the current environmental crisis. The Doubleday Dictionary that I use at home defines the words conscience as the faculty by which distinctions are made between right and wrong, ethical judgment, or sensibility. The word conscious as mentally aware of one's inner thoughts and feelings and also of things external to oneself. And consciousness as the state of being conscious. It is in the single root word that I believe we can find the meeting point of science and religion and the purpose in our future. This is an unprecedented time in the history of humanity. We are currently faced with the universal challenge to continue the evolution of creation. During my time in seminary, I worked with the nonprofit Center for Theology and Natural Sciences on a program called Science and the Spiritual Quest. This was a four-year Templeton Foundation grant initiative to bring leading scientists from around the world into dialogue at the interface of science and spirituality. As I became familiar with the scientists that were willing to participate in the emerging dialogue between science and religion, I found myself searching for the modern-day theologians that would represent the spiritual in this work. There I was in 1998, the very tail end of the 20th century, to find that there was almost no curriculum for seminarians on the topics of ecological ethics. 
Fortunately, I was not the only student recognizing that the call that had brought us together at the Graduate Theological Union, also known as Holy Hill in Berkeley, California, this call was not only asking us to study theology from a historical perspective, it was also calling upon us to become conscious leaders of the environmental movement. So we did what students committed to the evolution of education have done time and time over. We created a new community to discover new ways of thinking, growing, and being. This new ecumenical student group became the Theological Roundtable for Ecological Ethics and Spirituality, for short trees, focused on the theological, spiritual, and ethical aspects of human activities that affect the health and sustainability of our interdependent web of existence. Our collective mission was not to get lost in the world of academia, but instead become the prophetic voices for the future of generations we heard pleading with us to change. To care for creation and to serve the most vulnerable among us are mandates shared by all major religions. The accelerating climate crisis and the consequences of global warming are the most urgent and dangerous symptoms of a failure by people of faith to fulfill this universal mandate. I propose that the climate crisis that is threatening our very existence is fostering an emerging dialogue between science and religion, and it will give birth to the next efflorescence in creation. It will be through the act of conscious evolution that consciousness will continue to evolve. The crucial piece that will incite this process is the awareness of humanity's dependence on its environment. In the words of Pierre Théard de Chardin, the 20th century French Jesuit paleontologist, I quote, the day will come when after harnessing space, the wind, the tides, and gravitation, we will harness for God the energies of love. And on that day, for the second time in the history of the world, we shall have discovered fire. As we reconnect to the natural world, a new energy will be born. This is the revelation that both science and religion have been in search for. During those years in seminary, when I was searching for meaning in the nature, purpose, and point of the universe, I did not know that the beginnings of what is now the national and international movement of the Interfaith Power and Light Campaign would be taking shape just down the road in San Francisco, led by Reverend Sally Bingham, founder of the Regeneration Project. Nor did I have any idea when I was co-founding the student group Trees, would I one day become the director of North Carolina Interfaith Power and Light. But I believe it is in the evolution of what we create day after day after day, with our very own hopes and dreams, that our lives play out in story. It has been an absolute blessing to be able to share with you my story this morning, knowing that each of you have your own past, present, and future journeys. And I believe that it is together in community that we find joy through our collective evolutions and creations. The story of how this congregation has installed solar is an incredible example for the entire Chapel Hill community. Just this past week, over 100 North Carolina faith leaders, including your very own Reverend Tom Bloat, signed on to an open letter to the General Assembly, printed it as a full-page ad in the News and Observer, challenging ourselves and our political leaders to continue to improve clean, renewable energy policies in North Carolina. North Carolina Interfaith Power and Light leaders delivered copies of the paper to all 187 legislative offices. And the very next day, on Earth Day, 
the Energy and Environment Committee of the General Assembly voted to keep North Carolina's renewable energy portfolio standard. Faith leaders are vocally supporting two additional bills that would allow third-party solar sales in North Carolina and extend the solar tax credit beyond the end of the year. There is very good reason why the religious community must come forth with the moral and ethical values that it has always brought to issues that affect the common good. Religion brings the spiritual awareness that motivates change. Through the lens of faith, hope trumps despair. May the rediscovery of fire be the chalice we light to reconnect, for creation to continue to unfold, for evolution to continue to occur, and for God to continue to become.